Today, I've got a brand new guest for you. Her name is Nina Collins and she is part of Revel. Now, I'm going to get Nina to explain a bit more about Revel, but my uh, my way of describing it is it is a social platform specifically created for women over the age of 40, I think. We need to double check this for Nina. Um, now, Nina's got... Uh, a background in creating spaces where women can come together and explore things and talk about things very openly. I'm very mindful that this is a female focused episode, but hopefully if you don't um, define yourself as uh, as female, then um, you would still find much to be uh, curious about um, because Nina and I are going to be talking about aging. And it's something that I think really warrants our attention. You know, what does it feel like to age? And one of the things I want to talk to Nina about is aging kind of through all of our ages, not just at the age that I am now. So I'm 53. I think Nina's a little bit younger than me. Um, but the whole the whole experience of aging as we go through the different stages and i can see nina has joined so i'm going to pause you and let her in so nina lovely to have you here and um thank you so much for taking time out of your holiday in fact uh, it's fun being in the same time zone with you so yeah i'm in copenhagen on vacation and it's nice that we're in the same because now i've been working in the evenings you know in europe because everyone is at home in new york so yeah it's fun. Glad yeah to and so you're on this wonderful extended trip across europe is it all all europe we, so I'm 53 and my boyfriend is 62 and I've been an empty nester already for, I don't know, at least five years. My kids have been basically out of the house. Um, but he, as long as we've been together, which is a little over four years, he has still had his youngest child at home. He has three sons and his youngest son just left for college this fall. And so this is kind of a celebration of the change in our lifestyle that, you know, we haven't really figured out how we want to do. Um, we thought let's go to Europe for a month. Also because of COVID, he's a lawyer, a litigator. Um, so he used to think he wouldn't be able to travel as much as like I thought I wanted to, but now he can, cause we can all just work remotely. It works so well. So we thought let's go to Europe for a month. So we went to Amsterdam for a week and we're now in Copenhagen for two weeks. And then we're going to Portugal for a week and we're just like staying in Airbnbs and you know, trying to live like locals a little bit. It's really fun. Yeah, it's really nice. And and what a beautiful segue into what we're going to talk about today, actually, this this idea of aging. And I know when, when you and I kind of talked about what we're going to talk about, it, I've, I've deliberately kept it very loose because I'm, I'm very mindful of uh, the conversations that we've had before where, you know, it's just been very rich and... Uh, explorative yeah, sort of conversation yeah, around this whole it. topic. No, I really appreciate it actually, Henny, because today, um, you know, today is actually World Menopause Day. Today is October 18th. And I was just having a conversation over WhatsApp with one of my colleagues about all these um, kind of menopause events that are going on in New York right now. And honestly, sometimes I feel like it's all very empty. I hate to be, there's just a lot of like, no one talks about menopause. I mean, all things that are true, but I kind of want the conversations to be richer. Oh, Nina, yeah. honestly, <laughs> you could, I feel very similarly, you know, yeah, and just, you know, I do a lot of work in the menopause space. Yeah, it's but, totally important. And, mm. and it's not that, I mean, it, I do sometimes realize because as a content producer, I sometimes get bored talking about like hot flashes and, you know, hormone treatment only because I know a lot about it. And then I realized, you know, there are a lot of people who need this information. So that's totally valid, but there is so much more. I think about like the work, have you read, um, you probably have, cause you're English, Deborah Levy. Like I love the, oh, there's this writer named Deborah Levy. She's written three books. Well, she's probably written more, but she's written this series of memoirs. The last one's called On Real Estate. You have to read her. So she's Ooh. like a woman in our age. She's probably a teeny bit. How old are you? 53, really? same yeah, as you. Same age. She's mm -hmm. a little bit older than us. Um, and she, I think she might originally be American, but she lives in, 
she lives in London and has, maybe she's English. I don't know. Um, anyway, she's wonderful. And she writes about aging in a very kind of just really interesting, reflective, like not a kind of wah, 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 you know, like. <laughs> I, think, I think also my feeling is, it's interesting actually, because last night I was hunting. We haven't got all of our books here because we've, we've moved into the, this house about a year ago and we're still slightly playing Tetris with things. And, um, and I was just like, I really need, I really need a book that's going to inspire me. So looked on the shelves that we've got here and read everything and there was nothing I wanted to reread and then I just thought well I'll have a look on like iBooks or Kindle or whatever and still all so many of the books seem to be telling wanting to tell me things that essentially I I already know you know the yeah. it was this sort of um and very little seemed to be about enriching the experience of um you know being being in these beautiful wisdom years yeah no I agree I'm actually just looking because there's a book that I think you should read by Carolyn Heilbrun called The Last Gift of Time Life Beyond 60 Ooh. which I think is a really interesting book um Carolyn L-Y-N and then Heilbrun H-E-I-L-B-R-U-N I should do like a blog post on the best women writers on aging I think because yeah that's a really lovely thing well if you do I will share that with my I will send it to you yeah, yeah my guys as well because and I'll share these titles in the show notes for people because I think that yeah this idea of um it's it's the kind of like it's the next step in like what is this experience and how how do we enrich it um so I'd love to just talk to you a little bit about Revel and you know because essentially I see that as a as a place for women to interconnect mm -hmm. and to I suppose a lot of the time actually learn from each other and share with each other that's that's my reflection yeah no I mean that's a great that's, that's a great description of what it is um so Revel, it's uh, the website is hellorevel.com, um, R-E-V-E-L, and it's uh, basically an events and social platform for women in the second half of life. We've kind of stopped talking about specifically over 40, over 50, over 60. It's women, I mean, what we find, which I know you'll relate to, is so many women in our demographic we have these big kind of transitions, you know, our kids have left the house, we've gotten divorced or widowed, or, um, you know, we're um, having new different health challenges. Like our life is different, right? In this moment, sometime around over 40, over 50. Um, and some of the existing social structures we've had, for example, like that we do through our kids, you know, have changed. And a lot of us are wanting to figure out how we want to live in the second half of life. And Revel is a platform for women to basically create events, attend events, and you can really create whatever you want. So you could create like, like I have a, I read Middlemarch this summer, for example, I wanted to read Middlemarch and kept not doing it. And so I created a Revel event and said, let's all read Middlemarch this summer and then meet to discuss it. And so we meet virtually or in real life and we have, you know, there are hikes and book clubs and dance classes and yoga classes and cooking classes, but they're all women teaching each other. It's all member generated mostly. Um, and then we also have like, you know, um, online chat rooms, you know, like Facebook groups organized by subject and region. So it really is a whole universe for women to kind of celebrate each other and learn from each other and lean on each other. And it's it's a beautiful thing. Mm. And I love, I love the way you talk about it when you say that it's our existing social structure might have shifted. And, mm -hmm. you know, something I see a lot with the clients that I work with and, and with friendship groups as well is that, um, and you're right, it's not a defined age when this happens, but as children go through their different stages of aging, that relationship that we have with them shifts as well. And our role changes with, you know. Remind me, you have kids, right? I've got, I've got one son who's no. 21. Yeah. 
Yeah, it really, it's an interesting time. I mean, that's another thing I do on Revel is I have a group called um, Support Group for Moms of Adult Children because I found this year that I really needed help and, and it's, it's an ongoing challenge for me. My kids are 28, 24, 24, and 22. And our relationships, you know, it's really different. You have your kids at home, you're raising them, you feel in control to some extent. And then they're out in the world and they have a lot more power. They can engage with you or not engage with you, right? There's all the money stuff. They're like, how much do you help them? Do you not? the boundaries, the just missing them, the worrying about them, you know, it's just a complicated moment. Um, and, and I assume it will change again. I assume once they're like 30 and beyond, it will be a different thing. But this, this 20 something period is, it's hard. Yeah. Like I often find myself, I mean, daily, like wanting to reach out to my kids and then kind of trying to remind myself that they probably don't want to hear from me every day. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I this, uh, this weekend I had a, a group of friends here. We have um, a group of girlfriends. We all met at university. Um, each year we get together for at least one weekend, and it's just us, and it's incredibly special. And it's slightly sort of um, changing group as to like who can make it. Yeah. Um, that this is hilarious. I've literally just had a message from my son pop up on my screen. Oh, he nice. must have like known. <laughs> Lucky you. Well, yeah. Although the message said, "No, I haven't sorted it yet." <laughs> so you can... That's very funny. <laughs> but it's interesting. We were talking this weekend about about this sort of changing dynamic and and relearning the rules of engagement because when they're not when they're not with us directly that that uh, you're absolutely right how how much do we get involved and um and and what's our license here as well because when they're little our license is very clear exactly Just take know. care of them it's kind of your everything and they yeah. love you. they want you also all the time right you go from like being completely desired to a much more nuanced Thing. And that's how it should be, of course. And that is, of course, how it should be. And, then, and it's different, of course, also between girls and boys. It's, it is, it's just very hard though, right? Because you go from being their everything and, and they're your everything. And then you have this enforced, this, you know, whatever, everyone has to move on to that next phase. Mm. And, 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 and it's also great. I mean, I love, I love the freedom I have now. Um, and the quiet and you know the and I'm <laughs> and there's there's also there's something here as well I think about you know um observing either our relationship with our own children or the relationship that friends have with their children okay. how it it also makes me reflect on my relationship with my own parents as well and you know my dad's still alive and he's in his 80s he's um he's in incredible health and and well-being really and and so i'm very grateful for that but i'm also very i'm kind of curious about that relationship that he and i have because to him you know i am still his daughter mm -hmm. i'm still and forever will be you're it's... lucky. Yeah, that's sweet. I, I really, I don't have, because my mom died when I was um, just to turn 19. And I, I, I have a father who's alive, but I've never been close to him. And I haven't spoken to him in about 15 years. And um, so I really don't, you know, I don't have a parent. And mm -hmm. it's, um, it's definitely, of course, influenced my own thinking about parenting and my own, probably the difficulty I have separating with them, because I'm kind of, as a 20 something, I didn't, I didn't have anyone taking care of me. So I think I, you know, I don't quite know what the right way to do it is. Um, but it's also interesting what you bring up about other people's children. Like I just saw a post in our community this morning, actually. And, and then we have these, you can post anonymously and someone posted anonymously to say, I look around at everyone else's relationship with their adult children and everyone seems so much happier and better than me and mine. And, um, you know, I think that speaks a little bit to social media and it speaks a little bit to like false expectations and, um, but this woman was really kind of in pain. She said she just feels like, you know, 
she'll never be close enough to her kids and she's ruined it. And, and I just want to say to her, like, it will change, like nothing static, you know, but. Mm. Yeah. And also, gosh, there's something in there about this attachment that we can have to an ideal. Yes. And, you know, yes. every dynamic is different. Yeah. You know, gosh, I mean, I, and, and when I, when I think about my own son, there are there are certain behaviors that I can see, you know, like I know you have also done a lot of work on yourself, you know, been through your own process of like understanding yourself. And when I when I look back at um, some of the patterns of my own behavior and look further back as to like, where did they come from? And then take that very uncomfortable look at like, oh, and how did they play out in my own parenting? And mm. gosh, I can see some stuff that I, you know, I could have done differently. It's so but it funny. is what it is. It's really interesting you say this. I do really love talking to you. I hope we meet one day in person because I was just a few minutes ago, I wanted to ask you kind of out of nowhere and you've really just brought it up, like what your relationship to regret is as you age. I think that's something we don't talk about enough and or just kind of explore enough. Like I, when I was younger in my twenties and thirties, I remember, I, in fact, I think I wrote a blog post about it at some point, like not having regrets. And now that I'm in my fifties, I have a kind of painful sense of regret about some things, about mm -hmm. things that I really just, I look back and I feel like I cringe, like I am just embarrassed for the way I handled things and couldn't do better and oh it's just awful you know and of course part of the process is we just we have to forgive ourselves and we have to and, and, I, and I and I do that like I don't you know it's not like I'm not beating myself up actually but it, it's I just wonder if everyone feels that way yeah. I mean I I think regret is such a in fact that might you might have just landed on the title for this uh podcast episode yeah. age without regret or or maybe managing the regrets I don't know because because I think you know to, to air is human yeah and there and but there is something really powerful about recognizing the stuff that we could have done differently and and I'm I'm really mindful about the language there that and for me that this has been a very very important part of my own kind of process of healing and whatever it's been to to shift that language from I should have done it differently to I could have done it differently mm. you know and or could you though I mean I'm not and I may I could in a different set of circumstances right right you know or if I had had that thought that I had later <laughs> before I acted yeah. I could have done it differently, but, but you're right. I mean, so often I think we are, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite things, uh, to remember and, um, and talk about really is that, you know, most people, most of the time are mostly doing their best. Yeah. And that includes me. Yeah, no, that's certainly true. I mean, I, God, I look at how, I mean, I guess the thing that it, that makes me sad is I wonder, like, I feel like if I, you know, obviously if I knew then what I knew now, what I know now, and, and also, will I look back on this time in 10 years? Will I look back on this time and think that I didn't handle it well? Cause I mean, I guess in some ways that's the nature of life, right? You're two errors human, as you just said, and we're continually growing and getting wiser and learning more. Um, but it just feels like I don't know. I suppose, I mean, the question that comes up for me is what is the value of regret? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, maybe like, I mean, people say there's no real value in feeling guilty, right? Is it similar? Like, like I don't suffer from feeling, well, I feel some guilt with my children, but um, I try not, like, I don't feel like guilt is something I experience a lot. And I guess they're probably this similar what is the value of regret? It's a little bit also like, what is the value of shame? I mean, I suppose all these things you you want to learn from past behavior. Mm. I don't know. I think, I mean, I, I, I very much feel that, 
you know, and oh gosh, it can take a bit of time to to get to this place. So this isn't like I spend my whole time in this like, you know, perfectly balanced state of equilibrium. But, you know, there are times when like a part of me will really be very dominant and be demanding some attention. And, you know, maybe that is a feeling of regret about something and I can feel that part like wanting to take me off into this like spiral which ends with I'm an awful human you know Mm -hmm. and and so it's in those moments um where I kind of I can sort of catch myself doing it is to turn toward that part and and really communicate with it as to like what does it need what is it asking for Mm, nice and so when you know and often it's just it's just asking for some love yes you know right. just needs a bit of reassurance and often it's a very kind of young part that is actually bringing that kind of you know guilt shame regret to the fore because it's a part that hasn't yet learned how to manage what it's feeling yeah and that's beautiful i mean it really is really beautiful and it's a very good reminder. You're right. When you're kind of, when I'm, when one is whatever wallowing or experiencing some of these difficult feelings is really, you, you need to love yourself, right? Mm-hmm. You need to say, like, and you need to forgive yourself and you need to take care of yourself. And I think that is really true. And I do think that's something that we, I, I've gotten much better at as I've gotten older. Like even when I'm having the worst feelings I it when I was younger I feel like I spent a lot of time in my 20s and 30s like really not knowing how to manage my emotions and now I'm so much better at at recognizing something for what it is and knowing that it will pass and but this is helpful you're it's helpful to talk to you and remind oneself that you know kind of being kind to yourself is huge I I had an experience yesterday so I shared that um a group of girlfriends here and there were there were seven of us here in total and it was gorgeous Nina honestly it's just you know that was your partner around or was no no he'd he'd gone uh off to see his own mum and um and so we were just here and it was it was lovely we did cacao and we did oh we went for walks and it was just gorgeous and yesterday morning i woke up so they all left on sunday and i woke up yesterday morning and i knew my energy had dropped mm. like and not just like physically but i'd like and and i have got a history of being a little bit spike and down mm-hmm. so i'm very mindful now when it happens i used to just go to bed and say i was ill now I recognize um, my energy's dropped. Something's sort of knocked me. Mm-hmm. And Anton, Anton, and I always have a coffee in bed in the morning. And he went down to get the coffee and I lay in bed and I just felt these big fat tears falling mm-hmm. out of my eyes. And I just like lay in bed and had a little sob. Yeah. And then he came back up and he said, are you okay? And I said, yes, I just really needed to cry, but I can't, I couldn't yet articulate why. Yeah. And then... I looked at, I was thinking about like, God, I really need to, I really need to pay myself some attention this, this day. Mm -hmm. And I was able, fortunately, to juggle things in my diary. And we actually spent the day, we'd went to the coast, which is miles away, Mm -hmm. and walked and just drove through some beautiful countryside. And nice. Now, the thing is, for me, that was my way of restoring myself. Yeah, that's really that's really smart. It's a great story. And I mean, going to nature, I do feel oh. makes all the difference for me now. Mm. And and just knowing what you need and taking it. I mean, mm. and having, of course, the luxury of being able to do it is incredible. Um, but you're absolutely right. And same for me. I, I still often will just go to bed when I've had too much and it's my way of restoring. Um, I love to like get in my bed and have books all around me and just not leave. Um, but also going to nature. I mean, those are really my two answers for mm. sure. When I'm feeling And I, I think that's the thing. And so my, my reflection yesterday morning was if I can clear my diary, 
I'm going to clear my diary and it might make the rest of my week a little bit harder, but it's going to make today so delicious that it's worth it. But if I couldn't clear my diary, I, I'd, because I was in that frame of mind of what can I do to restore myself? If I could only have taken half an hour to lie on the floor and listen to some, you know, to a yoga nidra or something like that, then I would do that because I was actively choosing myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that back to this whole idea of aging, really, I think that is the thing that I have learned as I've got older is that, you know, my attention on myself is, is a really lovely thing. Yeah. And it benefits everybody around me, actually. Everyone. What do you think was bothering you? Do you think you were just depleted from all the emotional mm. kind of output? I mean, having seven women for a weekend, no matter how lovely, is exhausting. Yeah. And I'd had a really big week the week before. A lot of, lot of different uh, sort of bits of work all yeah. coinciding. And the previous weekend, I'd been in London doing some work. So I hadn't had, yes. you know, yeah, hadn't had a rest. Yeah. And and also, I think I was just like missing, you know, that kind of energy. Yeah. So, you know, when you're tired, I mean, I think this is another kind of learning, actually, is that what I used to do is get tired, find some external source that was going to boost me, whether that was other people, alcohol, a cigarette, like, you know, yeah. whatever that thing was. Whereas now, as I age... I feel more adept at finding the internal. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally understand that. That's so interesting. And mm. how long have you been with your partner? I can't remember. 32 years. Oh, my God. So he's the father of your child. Yeah. Wow. Look at you. <laughs> Do you know, oh, this is, this is a... Imagine. This is, this is now it feels like you're uh, I'm on your podcast but um but we were talking today about the moment uh when we fell in love and and just the fact that we both remember the moment and we were sitting in a car at some traffic lights in the city center in Nottingham and we'd only re we'd only sort of known each other a couple of weeks and we'd been chatting and then we stopped talking. And honestly, Nina, we both remember the moment where our chemical makeup changed, um, something happened and, and we fell in love. I mean, it's, amazing. Yeah. It's kind of, I really want to like do, I want to do that story a bit more justice at some point because it was, it's the fact that we both experienced it at the same time. Yeah, no, that's incredible. I mean, 32 years, you've obviously had, I'm sorry not to be interviewing you, but your ups and downs. And oh, my God. <laughs> so, but that is amazing that you both remember yeah. that exact moment. I don't think a lot of but, people. But is, is this part of the, the, the sort of aging without regret as well is... And maybe this talks to what you were saying about how will you feel in 10 years time or in 20 years time is that the is bringing this stuff with us that we have learned along the way. And for me, a huge part of that is the way that Anton and I communicate with each other, mm. which we just didn't when we were younger. Like we, we split up briefly at university for like six months at university maybe a bit longer, nine months. And, um, and our, our entire conversation was Anton saying, we need to talk and me saying, I know I'll move out. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's it. Were you, were you terribly upset? Oh my God. I was, I mean, devastated. I was so upset. I moved to Egypt. I mean, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but he came out to Egypt and everything yeah everything worked out but you know that thing of like communication i think that that is the key it's communication with ourselves so that's something i'd love to yeah ask you actually how how is it in a relatively new relationship as a as a 53 year old woman how does that feel from how it was when you were 23 33 well i think it 
has to do with so many things, right? Like, so this is a much, definitely the healthiest relationship I've ever had in term, in all those ways, in terms of communication and just, he, it's just an incredibly civilized adult, smart relationship. So I've gotten better at choosing. And I think that all has to do with like self work, right? Like understanding my own patterns. I had a, um, as I said, I don't, I don't, I think I said it here or maybe earlier that I don't speak to my father. Um, and so I had a kind of difficult father and a mother who chose difficult men. And, and I think, you know, there's that saying that kind of therapy concept that we love the way we were loved, you know, we're drawn to. And so I think for a long time, I was drawn to relationships that replicated things in my childhood that were painful. So even though they were not healthy, they were the, they were what I was used to kind of a certain kind of distance. A certain, so it took me many years to kind of understand those dynamics that I was kind of drawn to men who were kind of very remote. And, and as my therapist, I was in therapy for a long time in my, I don't know, thirties to forties for about 10 years with a very good person who helped me a lot. And she used to say, you know, you're always going to be drawn to the same kind of person. What we're going to do in therapy is kind of shrink it. So, it, you know, meet, meet a little more, a, l- a little healthier version of what you need because there's something that you're drawn to that you need and for me it's a kind of slightly aloof slightly arrogant slightly distant kind of male person um but i'm finally with someone who's actually you know has really good values and is very good at communicating and really treats me well and um so that's been really great and really a surprise like i didn't i mean if you had asked me 10 years ago if i that would ever be in a relationship like this. I don't think I would have thought it was possible. Wow. Um, so I think when I look at people like you who have been together with someone for their whole lives, I think, well, she must've had really good parents. <laughs> <laughs> and not that I'm blaming it all on my parents, but I mean, uh, well, um, yeah, it's interesting, Nina, maybe <laughs> this, because this isn't my story, if you sort of mean, but their story I might share with you one day. And <laughs> but having said that, I, I definitely, I definitely feel as though um, I learned how to be loved. Yeah. That's what I that, that I think that is something like I definitely have I mean I've, as we see with women our friends all the time like you know we all have friends in bad relationships or friends who aren't being treated well or you know whatever I think I've gotten much better with my own boundaries at knowing kind of how I want to be in relationship both with my mm. lover and my friends and my children and how I want to be treated and how I want to treat people. So I, I think a lot of that has to do with, in my case, just, you know, a lot of self-work and getting yeah. older. Um, but then I also think sometimes like people who've been in these long-term relationships, re- you know, relatively stable, happy, lifelong relationships, some of it is also just luck, you know, who we find at a certain age and um, yeah. I, you know, I was really driven early to just find someone after my mom died when I was 19. I, I really wanted to like create a life. Like I got married, I married a man I met when I was 20 and he was much older than I was. And it was just not, I, I was scared. I was, I operated for a long time out of fear. Um, and I, I know before we came on air and you, you mentioned about your mom and you sort of brought her in and I've been thinking of her because I, I, I know that you've sometimes shared these incredible images of her on your Instagram and, you know, she just looked like a very um, captivating woman, actually, that would be my uh, observation from afar. But sort of bringing her into this conversation and, and actually I'd like to welcome my own mum in as well who was yeah. also a very um, captivating woman in many ways and you said something around not knowing how to age or what mm-hmm. this sort of process of aging was like because your own mum had died when you were so young yeah and I'm I'm thoughtful. I've got other friends whose um, mothers particularly have died when they were younger. And I, I hadn't really ever t- taken that on board. So, yeah, I think it is. 
I think it's a good, so, so I was 19 when my mom died and I did, I was very lucky. I had two grandmothers I was really close to. And I always say I had a white grandmother and a black grandmother. I'm half black, half white. And I was really close to both of them. My black grandmother was uh, kind of more religious and very loving and affectionate and not kind of as intellectual. And my white grandmother was a kind of cold wasp super intellectual and super efficient and um, really interested in art and um, not warm at all. Um, but I really loved them both and I was very close to them both. And, um, but they don't really count. Like for a woman, when you're thinking about getting older, like I knew my grandmothers, what starting at, they were 65, 70 when I was kind of cognizant of them. So yeah, as I went into my, the way I always describe it is that for years, I had my mother kind of ahead of me when I was 24, 25, 28. Mm. At least I knew what she was like until she was 46. Like I mm. had this image of what it was like. And then suddenly I turned 46 and I had no idea what she would have been like after that. What would my mother have been like at 50 or 55 or 60? I have no idea. And, and, and also I have no model I didn't have a mother in my twenties, right? I didn't, and don't have one now. So I have no idea what that relationship could be like. Um, yeah, it's a big loss. You know, it's a, it's a, and, and I really do think that the community that I created, which was originally called what would Virginia Woolf do? And then it was called the Wolfer and then it was acquired by Revel was a community for women to talk about aging and a kind of funny self-deprecating, like smart girl, funny, like sassy way. Um, but I do think I created it uh, completely un, like subconsciously because I was looking for like mother figures and sister figures. Like I, I was 46 when I created that group, the same age my mom was when she died. And I, I think I wanted some answers that I didn't know where to get. You know, my grandmothers had just died right around then. And, uh, and yeah, I felt very, I just alone without role models. And, so and, then now, and I will say, actually, I do feel because of the community now, like it's like seven years later, because and women like you and all the women I've gotten to know, I do feel like I have role models now. I don't feel as alone, which is nice. amazing. Yeah. And what a beautiful, um, gosh, I mean, I, I just want to honor every word that you've just shared. It's, you know, just to take a moment there and and also I just love how your inner wisdom led you to create what it was that you most needed which was that uh that community and and the role models like yeah. you said no thank you I know I have to hold on to that because I'm starting to really think I don't know about you but I'm really I think part of this thing about getting older is like, for me anyway, maybe because my mother died young, I'm so aware that we might not have that much time, mm -hmm. right? And I really want to think about like, how do I want to spend the next 10, 20 years? And, um, and having faith that I'll figure it out and will create what I need is hard to have faith in sometimes, right? Yeah, I yeah, uh, I uh, recognize that. Um... And, and, and I yet believe we, we, and yet we, we do, do, we really do. <laughs> we do, we do. And, and also this kind of comes back to this point about regret as well, actually, mm -hmm. I think, because, because often the stuff that we regret can have uh, tendrils out in a positive way into choices that we might make later on in our life you know 100 percent, right it's so true i mean it's like well, the whole thing with regret is kind of in some ways you can look at it and think it's ridiculous like i'm so grateful for where i am now yeah, exactly and i wouldn't be here if i hadn't gone through all the things i've gone through yeah yeah but but it's also it's about kind of honoring the feeling honoring the part of us that that holds that feeling sending yeah. love to that part yeah. And also acknowledging, gosh, like all of these other parts might never have got a, you know, a breath of air if yeah. I hadn't, you know, yeah. done what I did. And also as trite as it can kind of sound, I think we have to give a nod to just gratitude, right? Like I had a moment today in Copenhagen where I'm visiting, I was biking on the street and I was by myself and I had a real moment where I kind of stopped the bike and said like, 
this is beautiful and I am really lucky to be here. And uh, like, I am really grateful that I'm having this experience. And like, we, that's another part of it, right? Like Mm. all the time to kind of think about what's good. What I find helps me with that also, I've been reading a lot of um, books set in earlier centuries. I'm reading right now, Girl with Pearl Earring, which is like a big Mm. classic about Holland in the 1600s. And I read Middlemarch, as I said earlier, this summer. And when you read about women in other centuries, it helps me like, you know, probably have better context about my own life and my own regrets. And like, you know, when you really like look at, I don't know. There's something immensely powerful about gratitude. I mean, I, I, for a long time, I did a, I I still have the Instagram uh, feed called in fact, I changed the title, but it was 21 Beads of Gratitude. And it was a intensely personal, um, very private space. So I never, you know, publicized it particularly. But um, every night I wrote 21 things that wow. I was grateful for. And it began on a whim, as so often these things do. And then it was like, and then it became a bit of a, a kind of, gosh, this was hard at times to find 21 things. Do you feel like they had to be different every day, like completely different? Uh, Often they would be repeated. Um, But sometimes it was down to the simplicity of that raindrop falling down the window. My eyes that can see that raindrop. Yeah. The cloud that the raindrop came from, you know, this light. And gradually it would sort of expand out, you know, even at a time when I was feeling maybe very closed in. Yeah. that practice and I think it changed my DNA honestly Nina I mean like you no know, they say I mean I think there are a lot of studies that show how much it can do for you and I I mean I totally agree I remember having a really funny moment once a few years ago going to the toilet in the middle of the night and peeing and feeling how great it, it, I must have been influenced by the community feeling really grateful that my body worked that I I could like healthily just like pee get Amazing. up go to the bathroom and pee you know? and, and that you could get yourself there and that you I had a bathroom and yeah oh god that's it's just gorgeous funny, you know but yeah I mean there are millions of things all day long we should be aware of that we're not probably and yeah that's a well, good that's and good. again this sort of references back to I think a lot of the narrative around menopause that I um can find myself struggling with which is that you know so much of it is still intensely negative and it's all about it needs to be fixed yeah and um you know we need to suppress all of the things that we're experiencing and um and i you know i deeply recognize the challenge that so many women face with certain symptoms or a collection of symptoms and the experience that they have with that and and i also recognize that within this kind of melee is this opportunity to really get to know ourselves and and actually gratitude can be an incredibly powerful tool for that not in the sort of suppression and everything is great and i'm just going to keep saying it um in that like genuine gratitude for what our body is doing it's really so true i mean another thing so in copenhagen on this vacation i've been really noticing it's when i posted something on facebook saying it was the first time um on vacation i'm just i'm just very aware copenhagen's a very young city there are lots of young people everywhere and it it doesn't make me feel bad it's just made me aware that i'm really in a different place now. I don't want to go out to the meatpacking district at night. I'm not, I'm not smoking cigarettes. Like it used to be that I would go to Europe and smoke some cigarettes in cafes. I don't really feel like doing that anymore. And, um, but I, but I feel really grateful that I'm here and doing it. I'm just kind of cognizant that I'm in a different place and that's not bad. It's just true. Like (laughs) this whole, this whole thing about I agree with you completely about like menopause being so bad and all these symptoms being so horrible. I mean, some of the symptoms are weird and you have to figure out how to manage them and you get through it. And, um, but it is really an opportunity this moment in our lives. There's no doubt. I, I mean, that's, there's just been a, a sort of a little segue thought back to 
what you were sharing about your own mother and you Mm -hmm. starting the Wolfers when you were 46. And I am very aware that um, my work became, it became very evident that a large part of my work was focused on women experiencing menopause. And it has occurred to me that actually an awful lot of that work that I'm doing is really I'm I'm trying to help my mum mm-hmm. through the experience that, that she had. Um, even though I know when she was kind of in her 70s, she said to me that her menopause was absolutely fine. The experience of that as a 15 year old is slightly different. So anyway, Vivian, I'm just mm. like, just sort of just sharing that darling. Um, you know, that this, uh, this work that I'm doing is really about supporting her. Oh, interesting. You know, the healing process, you, but was your experience of her at that time difficult. Yeah. Well, it was, I think, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, not, I think it was, um, and, and so what was my connecting thought? Um, j- just this idea that we often find ourselves doing the work that we most need to do. So I think on some level, it is maybe my adolescent self that has been asking me to do this particular work that I'm doing in order to, to help heal whatever her experience was. Wow that for you perhaps you know actually by creating this space you're also creating something that your own mum didn't have at that age yeah, yeah. and it's gosh. <laughs> at some point this is all a little it's a little kooky but for years i had this recurring dream about my mother that she wasn't actually dead that she just didn't want to see me it was a super painful weird wow. dream that i would have once or twice a year for me i mean she's been dead you know 30 something years and um and then about four or five years ago or maybe three years ago i had a dream that she <laughs> that she asked to join the wolfer community that she like facebook requested <laughs> It was the funniest dream. And since then, I have not had the dream that she's not actually dead. <laughs> Nina, I mean, that is, I think I just channeled your mom. I don't know what just you know, happened. It is really, really funny. I mean, my relationship with her has definitely changed. I mean, it has to do with a lot of things. I think, you know, she, my mother was a filmmaker and a writer. And in the last, uh, I don't know, eight years, I've kind of, um, I've, have I've rediscovered helped her career be rediscovered and she's a little bit famous now her name was Kathleen Collins Kathleen with a K C-O-L-L-I-N-S and she was the first black woman to make a feature film in America so I think in a lot of ways my relationship with her has changed because I've had this professional um success with her work and but but yeah there's something else to it there's something about me becoming menopausal and getting older and I don't know and creating something that she wanted to join. I mean, yeah, wow, yeah, it's cool. That's wow. really cool. I just feels like I feel like I could talk with you forever. Actually, oh, yeah, it's, so nice. it's just delicious. And what a yeah, what a rich. Um, a rich conversation and I feel as though that there's so much I know this is going there's so much in in what you've shared actually which is going to percolate for me um but it feels like a lovely place to yeah. close with this well I want you to look up Deborah Levy's book on real yeah. estate and then let me know what you think of it because really on real estate it. it's called on real estate it's a trilogy and it's the third one but you don't have to have read the others you can just read on real estate and I think it's the best one and okay. I you like it Okay, wonderful. And then the last gift of time. Yeah, the Carolyn Heilbrun. I think that will also be a good one. Mm, I definitely I am going to. Do you ever to... come to New York? I want you to come to New York. And oh, visit. do you know, the last time I came was, um, my son was 14, actually. Oh, wow. And the time before that, I was pregnant with him. Oh, wow. And and I, I I should just go to England because it's more fun. So maybe, maybe yeah, I'll... yeah. Well, you know, you're not that far away right now. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and I, hopefully, I'm going to be traveling more. So we'll meet hopefully one day. Yeah, that would be wonderful, Nina. Okay, I'm going to 
stop the recording and then you and I can can say goodbye afterwards. But thank you so much for being here. Yeah, really fun.